Hello, I'm Professor Russell Goldman, Dean of the Faculty of Arts at the University of Melbourne. I'm proud to acknowledge that I have the privilege of living and working on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout this land, uh, wherever you may be watching this video from. Welcome to the fourth installment of this uh, Dean's Forum video series. Um, this is a series that I've set up to be able to have conversations with some of my colleagues, find out about the work that they're doing and how that work might help us to address, understand, make sense of the issues that we're living through today as a society. And precisely today, when all of our expectations have been overturned, when we're having to find new ways of thinking about how we live, how we live as individuals, how we live as communities, then who better to turn to for a conversation about all of that than a philosopher? It's my great pleasure then to welcome and to introduce to you Professor Margaret Cameron, who is the head of the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Melbourne. Margaret joined us uh, in 2019, just a few months after I started in the faculty. Uh, she'd previously served as Associate Dean for Research in the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Victoria in British Columbia. Margaret was born in Canada and she's a philosopher. She specializes in the history of philosophy, thinking particularly about the legacy of Aristotelian thought. Margaret, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you very much, Russell. I'm so pleased to be able to do this. Thank you. Um, one of the great things about your appointment, and I'm sure we'll, we'll cover uh, many of those today, but one of the great things is that this means that you are, as I understand it, the first woman to be a professor of philosophy at the University of Melbourne, uh, which in and of itself is a, is a fantastic achievement. Tell us a little bit about the journey that has brought you to this point. Tell us about your journey in and through philosophy and, and as I say, to being in this position as the first woman to hold a chair in philosophy in our university. Sure, thanks, Russell. Um, well, I never thought I'd be here um, when I started out in, in studying philosophy. Um, but of course, for, for most of us, academia is not um, a, a, a predictable path. I mean, that's true for your career. It's very true for my career as well. Um, I think perhaps there was a slightly older generation than us that had a more predictable path that did a PhD at an institution, perhaps had a postdoc there and then went on to you know, take on a, a permanent job there. There are, there are a few people that we work with who've been in that situation, but my pathway has been actually uh, all over the place. So I finished my PhD in 2005 at the University of Toronto. And um, I was very, very fortunate that I got a job immediately uh, upon graduating. And um, I think the timing was really important being someone who specializes in, especially the medieval philosophical tradition. There weren't very many jobs in that field after the 2008 financial crash. And, and I've always felt incredibly lucky to have just been accidentally there at that time, knowing that many of my younger colleagues didn't get that, that opportunity. There's a lot of serendipity in, in job success in academia. academia. Um, but after I got the first job, I then uh, also applied for a research position at the University of Cambridge and was there for two years working on a project that compared uh, Eastern and Western logic. So logic in the Arabic tradition and logic in the Latin Western tradition. Um, and then while I was there, um, I was approached to apply for the Canada Research Chair in Canada. And so in 2008, I headed to British Columbia and I had a wonderful 10 years at an institution that I absolutely adored and um, actually thought I would spend the rest of my career there. Um, yeah. I had great colleagues. I started up a journal with one of my colleagues. Um, we're just publishing with another colleague. We're just publishing a massive two volume book project that we put together. Um, you know, it's the best thing about your job is, is your colleagues when it, when it works well. Mm -hmm. um, but then the opportunity to come here arose and it was actually not so much at my initiative, but rather my husband Klaus's that when he saw the, the picture of Arts West in the shiny brochure that they sent to me and he saw the description of the job, which is 
heading a school that's really sitting in the heart of the humanities, which is where my passions lie, that he just thought this was the best opportunity to, to take. And so um, it worked out. And, and as you said, I arrived here, um, you know, just over a year ago. Um, I actually did not know that I was the first female professor of philosophy until quite some time into being here. And I'd been invited to um, give a little talk at the capstone um, subject for philosophy. In fact, the subject coordinator had invited all of the women in the discipline to come and explain how they got into philosophy and what it meant to them. And he introduced me as the first female professor at the university in, in philosophy, um, which led me to do some research in, into um, you know, why, why there weren't any um, women before me. Um, and when we go back to Arts West, everybody's welcome to go to the third floor and see the display cabinet that I created that was unveiled the week before we moved home to, to go teaching. So I don't think anybody's really seen it yet, but it looks at the history of women in the philosophy discipline. Um, and it shows that for a very long time, each of the disciplines had only one professor. Everyone else was a lecturer or a tutor. And given the timing, given you know, what was going on with gender equality at that time, it, those were mostly men in most disciplines. Um, and in philosophy, it was exclusively men. So in fact, there are, I'm also the, only the seventh professor in the philosophy discipline, right? Which shows you how, how long that, that pattern. Now we can have multiple professors you know, at the same time um, because we've adopted a different system, but, but that's how I ended up here. It's fantastic. And I, it's good to know that those uh, glossy brochures that we produce uh, <laughs> have such a good effect. They were very persuasive for me as well. Uh, I, I, and actually much of your story resonates with, with my own as well, which is, which is really interesting. Um, and and it will be really good to see that that exhibition once we are back in uh, back on campus and able to see something of that, that history of uh, the history of the discipline. And I know there are challenges for that discipline. Or my understanding is that internationally there are challenges for the um, discipline of philosophy in particular I mean, in terms of women's representation, particularly at those more senior levels. So it's interesting to see how our history in this institution fits into that. Uh, broader picture as well. One of the reasons why the University of Melbourne can boast uh, the earliest intake class of PhD, female PhDs um, is because all men were at war in the First World War and there weren't enough wow. students at the University of Melbourne. So there was this massive intake of, of women. So yeah. the lovely photographs of women in the, you know, 1915, 1920s sort of period sitting with their long dresses and their petticoats and things like that. And they're the, they're the philosophy discipline. They're the students of the philosophy discipline at that, at that time, you know, over a hundred years ago. That's fascinating. That's really interesting. So t tell us some more about how the kind of connections that you've been making precisely between your, your discipline, between your own uh, research interests, your own philosophical interests, the connections you've been able to make between those and the kind of situation that, that we're living through at the moment, that, that you're living through. Um, you know, where are you finding the, the resources philosophically to, to draw on? What kind of questions are you finding that you're able to ask fruitfully as you try to think through uh, the, the situation that we globally find ourselves in? That's a very good question. I, I mean, almost everything at this point, right? I mean, it, but I think one of the really interesting things is in this pandemic, we've all become a lot more philosophical. Um, we've been forced to be, but if by philosophical we mean here, you know, more reflective, more self-aware, um, and you know, we find ourselves asking questions about, you know, the value of our friends and the value of our families when we can't see them, you know, from from so far away, except through, you know, a medium like this, yeah. um, which we know is is not great. I mean, it's good. It's I'm mm. great the technology. We're also thinking about the value of social interaction, just those little moments. We, we don't have any of those experiences, or very, very few of those right now. And we think about the value of things like exercise and getting outside and being able to take an afternoon by the water or something. All, all these questions about value that I think we're all reflecting on right now are philosophical questions. They're, they're, they're not questions of fact, they're questions of value. And, and so that makes it a normative issue and, that, and being a normative issue makes it a, a philosophical issue. Um, and so, you know, one, one person that I, I have thought about a lot, um, and I, I in fact taught a unit on it um, this semester in the first year of philosophy subject was a, um, a, a book that was written in the fifth century um, 
in this in this era um, by a Roman philosopher named Boethius, and it's a book called *The Consolation of Philosophy*. And you know, one of the great puzzles of the book is in what way is philosophy providing consolation? Um, and for Boethius, this was an absolutely acute uh, moment in his life. He had been charged with political crimes. Um, he was in prison and he knew he was facing a certain death. Um, he knew he was about to be executed. And so he set out writing this um, book that became a medieval and modern masterpiece, um, you know, read by hundreds of thousands and translated into all sorts of languages, um, where he depicts himself in the first part of the book in prison. Right? So we think about ourselves, how long we've been in our homes, right? Um, he's in prison. He doesn't um, have anybody around him uh, except for some uh, imaginary poets that he's keeping himself company with. So the equivalent of TikTok or Twitter or whatever. Um, and he's completely depressed. He's completely lethargic and he feels despondent because he feels like he's lost everything of value. And there appears in the first scene, the figure of Lady Philosophy. And she comes in and diagnoses him as depressed. Um, the, the word is translated lethargic, but for us, it would mean depression. And what, what she does throughout the book is she brings Boethius from a state of being sick, right? Being mentally unwell to being healthy by using philosophy and philosophical arguments as the remedies. And the remedies get much more serious as we go along. But the first question that she addresses is this question of value. Mm -hmm. So Boethius, is think, Boethius thinks I've lost my home, I've lost my reputation, I've lost power as a politician, I've lost honor, you know, I, I don't have anything that I, that I once had. And Lady Philosophy through a very serious series of, of really interesting discussions says, did you ever really have those things? Like, were they ever really yours? Because these are the very things, first of all, that when we have them, they actually cost us more to have them. So think about money, for example. You might come into a whole bunch of money and so you buy a whole bunch of stuff. But then as soon as you do that, you have to buy a bunch more stuff to protect it. You need to buy locks, you need to buy insurance, you need to buy safety precautions. You know, all. So in fact, the more you get, the more vulnerable you are. Um, but if it can be so easily taken away by the, by the whim of fortune, by, by a, a you know, pandemic or by you know, being imprisoned, then it wasn't really yours. And, and so her goal is to sort of say, what is it that you have that can't be taken away? Mm. And that's your virtue, that's your, that's your moral character, that's, that's who you are, and, and for Boethius also it was God, right, because he was a, a believer in God. So um, I, I highly recommend reading that, and I've, I found a lot of solace in, in thinking about a man who lived, you know, 1500 years ago, but was reflecting on the very same questions that we're going through right now as we think about the things that we value, but that we feel that we've lost. In, mm. in, moment. Um, and I think well, I, there's a second book that I would really recommend that I've been thinking about a lot as well. Um, and that's a, um, a book that the main question is actually the title of the book. And it's called, uh, What Do We Owe to Each Other? And it was written by a, an American philosopher named Tom Scanlon. This is a hard one. And if we think about the way in which the world has responded to this question of what we owe each other, and how it's responded differently in different geographical parts of the world is very interesting. So take the issue of mask wearing, for example. So, you know, Dan Andrews said here at a certain point, look, it's bad enough. We now have to wear masks when we're out in public at all times, right? And it was mandated. The same thing was imposed in parts of the United States and we've seen what's happened there where the, the issue of wearing a mask or not wearing a mask or the issue of you know, abiding by a curfew or not abiding by a curfew has become a politicized issue. And mm. what Scanlon really helps us to understand is no, this is, a, this is a moral issue. This is not a political issue at all. This is a question of what we owe each other. So you have to figure out the answer to that question, which is what do we owe one another? And so he chooses to think about it in sort of contractual terms, right? And so thinking about it as a kind of social or moral contra contract. And, and the question is, what do we owe other rational beings? Whether these were rational beings that we know well and love, they're in our families or in our friendship circles or just other human beings. And so whether you wear a mask or not, or whether you, um, whether you tell the truth about a virus, I mean, think of, think of this, that question being asked of somebody like Donald Trump, who suggested that the coronavirus could be cured if you injected yourself with bleach. 
I mean, we owe each other the truth, right? At, at, at a very minimum. And so what he said is all these questions about whether we wear a mask or whether we tell the truth about, about a pandemic, these are practical claims about what we have reasons to do. Mm -hmm. And so what's the reason giving force of these types of what turn out to be moral judgments, right? Questions of, of, of character and, and behavior. And so the reason giving force for Scanlon is grounded in something that I think will resonate with all of us in this moment, which is it's grounded in the positive value of living with one another in certain ways, mm -hmm. right? The positive value of it. So po these things would include things like our mutual recognition of one another's rationality or our mutual recognition of the value of human life. And it's around those recognitions that we generate the reasons that motivate our actions. And so I can't think of a, a, a more compelling read at, at this time um, when we're facing questions like this all the time. Absolutely, and that really is compelling because it, it, from what you're saying there, it just goes to the heart of that. Um, what for me is a kind of paradox of what we're going through at the moment where the emphasis seems to be so much on um, yes the individual on you know the individual isolating themselves uh, the, the, the the kind of breakup and fragmentation of society um you know quarantine self-isolation and so on but actually in those very acts we are uh, uh, living out that sense of our, our connectedness with everybody else you know the extent to which my own health and well-being and the responsibility that I take for my own health and well-being is intimately bound up, you know, it, it, uh, with, the, with the health and well-being of every other human being in, in, on the planet. And just, yeah, try, trying to understand that is, uh, uh, I can see exactly the way that, 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 uh, that Scanlon's insights can, can help. Um, I was really struck also by what you were saying about Boethius's work and and interestingly, you know, given our reflections earlier on are about the status of the discipline, interesting that the philosophy there is is um, embodied, represented as a, as a as a female figure, lady philosophy. I think you were saying, and that whole yes, the whole kind of symbolism around uh, wisdom as feminine as well, isn't there? Um, but I, I I wanted to come back to I guess to that notion of consolation. Um, because for me, that Im immediately makes me think about uh, Ignatian thought and that dialectic of consolation and desolation. Um, I suppose, I, I guess my question then is, yes, I can see that philosophy can help us here and is helping us, helping us to think through these questions and uh, understand our individuality as well as our commonality. But are there, what about the limits of philosophy then? You know, are they, can there be, the opposite of consolation? Can there be desolation through thinking through these things philosophically? Or are there limits to the extent to which philosophy can help us think through the kind of issues that we're, that we're dealing with at the moment? Well, I think there are at least two different ways to answer that question. So thinking of the you know, consolation, desolation um, pairing, we've seen a lot of philosophical pathways, you know, ways of thinking, uh, leading to theories of nihilism, right? Mm -hmm. Leading yeah. to um, existential dread, existential despair. Um, you know, it's no coincidence that we're seeing um, similar kinds of political activities happening in the world that motivated those nihilistic theories, you know, in the first part of the 20th century, um, mm -hmm. the last part of the 19th century. I mean, I think we're coming really full circle around in this one. And I, I think it's Im important to actually recognize that history and recognize that people have had these thoughts before. People have been led to a, a, a place of despair and found that philosophy can't help them any further. And so one option in that case is to turn to faith um, and to <clears throat> you know, recognize that for the most part, philosophy is, um, is, a, is a rationalistic science. It's based in, and predicated on the power of human reason and what can we achieve by reason alone and so that leads me to my second point which is you know just as in the 19th century we saw what was basically a, 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 an institution like the university which was made up of moral philosophy and natural philosophy as its, as its two main areas of study in the 19th century people realized oh wait a second we can't answer some of these questions without going out into the world and getting our hands dirty so you know, the linguists went out into the field and did, you know, um, 
field linguistics and, and um, it did experiments with and on people and gathered data. And uh, you know, the economists had to get into a much more quantitative approach rather than a purely theoretical approach. And so we got economics departments breaking up, political scientists moving into you know, a, a different methodology. But I think importantly to hear some of our most pressing things philosophy can't answer um, mm -hmm. is, you know, what's the vaccine for COVID-19? We need to, we need the scientific community, we need the medical community at that point. And so there's going to be a lot of non-philosophical questions that will help us in this moment as we're thinking of, you know, despair versus consolation um, yeah. that are just very technical. Maybe they're, they're political, they're economic, they're medical. But that doesn't mean that philosophy doesn't come right back in at that very moment, because to whom do we distribute the vaccine? Who is owed a free vaccine? Who, to whom should we not give the vaccine for one reason or, or another because of maybe limitations on supply? Um, you know, uh, how should we structure our societies um, so that we don't find ourselves in a similar situation, you know, five years down the road from now with yet another pandemic? How, how do we um, understand our relationships with one another in public spaces? These are, these are political questions and they are questions of economics, but they are also always philosophical questions. So there is always a sort of consolation and be able to think there's another way to approach this ethically. There's another way to approach this in terms of, you know, caring for each other, you know, and, and respecting one another's autonomy and rationality. Um, so yeah, so there's certain, there's, there are certain limits to philosophy. Philosophy is not a panacea, but it's always there. Yeah, and it and it brings us back, uh, and what you've just been describing there about, you know, the potential next steps if when we have a, a vaccine. It brings us back to that question of value that you were talking about earlier on. So you know, the, the values that we use to make these decisions, but also how we how we see and define value, the value of human life. Do we think of people at different stages in their lives having different value and so 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 yeah the, the philosophy is always is always there as you say but there was a point in your answer where you talked about that theories of nihilism and and a point at which people might turn alternatively i think you were saying to to faith religion i wonder if you can say a little bit more about how you see that the the differences between i guess a philosophical worldview or a philosophical way of looking at the world compare differences between that and a, a religious view on, on the world? That's a, it's a really interesting question. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this as a medievalist. Uh, mm. it's, you know, I've been confronted with um, throughout my entire career. Um, and, you know, there's not there's no incompatibility with being a, a person of faith and being a, a, a philosopher. In fact, Historically, I think statistically, most people were uh, people of faith and were, were philosophers as well. Um, but I think that there is a difference when you've got your philosophy hat on versus when you've got your religious or, or, um, worldview hat on, um, if we can put it in that kind of crude way. The main difference is that a, a faith-based belief system is rooted uh, at, at its core in faith, in, in taking a leap. And, and recognizing that we don't have empirical evidence, we don't have purely rational evidence um, of even the existence of God. And so the starting point for um, religious worldview is that, that leap of faith. Right? Yeah. And I think then the difference with philosophy is to say, you can't start there. Our, our beliefs have to be grounded in evidence and they have to be justified by mechanisms that can be um, made public, that can be replicated, that can be, you know, this is part of the basis of the scientific method comes out of this philosophical way of thinking. And I think about one of the greatest moments in, um, you know, sort of the history of philosophy is when there was this big turn in the Middle Ages for religious believers who were philosophers to try to use the tools of philosophy to prove God's existence, which mm. is an extremely audacious thing to do that they thought, oh, philosophy can prove it, right? Like, the, and yeah. I mean, arguably none of those proofs has been successful. Um, people have found, found flaws in them. Um, some people accept them, but some people find flaws in them. I think that there's also a big difference, um, certainly in contemporary philosophy, not in ancient philosophy, but certainly in contemporary philosophy 
and religious worldviews in that it's not, philosophy is not dogmatic. In fact, it's sort of anti-dogmatic. And the, 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 the attitude towards confronting issues, problems, decisions, um, opinions, is that one should approach it with a, with a high degree of skepticism, mm -hmm. that, that we don't take things on face value, that we, ex we expect a proof, we expect some kind of evidence, whether that evidence is non-philosophical or, or philosophical, it doesn't really matter. It's just, it has to be rooted in something. Um, and it's not accepted because it's part of a dogmatic set of beliefs that form, form, form a core that creates the identity of that particular religious worldview. I think ancient philosophical schools were much more like religious um, sects or religious, because people would join the Stoics or the Skeptics or the Epicureans, and they would take on board with them mm -hmm. a way of life so that if you were a Stoic about one thing, you were a Stoic about absolutely everything else in your life. So you had a Stoic view of what the, what the natural world was made up of. You had a Stoic view of how you should behave ethically. You had a Stoic view of how language works, right? There, so there was a really kind of holistic um, card carrying member, right? That, that you would have to sort of take on board. And, um, and th that, that notion of philosophy as a way of life has, has not really been replicated in, in the modern world. The best comparator would be those ancient schools to a, a contemporary religious worldview. Yeah, thank you. Um, and interesting also to see how, I guess, and this might connect with what you were saying earlier about your own particular research interests, how was that interesting period around, you know, the sort of early modern period, 16th, 17th century, where some of that, that heritage starts turning towards what we now recognize or what we now see in, in more modern terms, in terms of, uh, of, of skepticism and the, the scientific method and, and yeah. so on. But am I right that that's the, the period that, you're, that you've worked particularly on? My, uh, I've mostly worked on the 12th century, uh, which oh, is okay. the start of the sort of medieval academic era. Um, partly because I was just very, very drawn to this one figure whose name is Peter Abelard of Abelard and Heloise. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, I, have work, I have worked in that period as well. And in fact, I teach uh, early modern philosophy next semester. Um, and you're right. So what, what had happened at the, I mean, these periodizations are, you know, not yeah. great. But what yeah. happened towards the you know, beginning of the 15th century um, is there, there was the recovery uh, in Europe of a massive wealth of literature that had been uh, lost to the, the medieval mm -hmm. academic tradition. So they really only had, in the, in the medieval West, they only really had Aristotle and Galen and some Augustine and you know, some Cicero and things like that. But they didn't have Plato. They didn't have writings of the Stoics and you know, Marcus Aurelius and all these other things. And there was a great rediscovery. I mean, that's what the Rena Renaissance really means. It's a rediscovery of the ancient world beyond Aristotle. Mm. And um, so you see a return of um, atomism, of cynicism, yeah. of skepticism, yeah. right? The whole, the whole uh, Cartesian turn, you know, to, yeah. to question whether or not we can believe anything that we know is just a, 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 a reinvention of an, the ancient skeptics, um, yeah. skepticism. And, and that was a way of life to live as a, to live as a skeptic. Um, yeah. For Descartes, it wasn't a way of life. It became a tool for mm. figuring out what we know if we and can we know anything at all so it's, it's kind of philosophy reinvented at that stage and so uh you're teaching some of that next semester what, what are you most looking forward to in in teaching that course or what, what are you most hoping that students will uh be inspired by in, in that in that course well i think there are two things that i mean i'm looking forward just to just teaching which is great but yeah two things um uh, that i'm really looking forward to so there's a group of of female, mostly uh, philosophers, who in the last 10 years have been doing a tremendous amount of work to recover the writings of women in mm. the early modern period that have not been part of the canon. The early modern period in philosophy was assigned to us by Kant, right? By Immanuel Kant. And he just basically said, all roads led to me, and then I solved all the problems and everyone became inspired. And so he just said, you know, it, it's really, you know, Descartes, Spinoza, Berkeley, yeah. Hume, um, and, and Kant. But it turns out that there were a lot of women who were in, um, not, in per, not in a professional context living as philosophers, but that were doing philosophy in all sorts of creative ways. And you know, just to give you an example, so 
you know, Descartes actually died because he was tutoring a princess who yes. and he claimed that she wanted to study so early, it was too cold and he, he died of, of, of cold. Um, yeah. Her writings have been recovered. And there've been a bunch of um, women who worked in, on the topic of metaphysics and their writing, I just, I just purchased a book which has a collection of their writings. There were women who were writing books about gardening and recipes who were actually Epicureans leaving mm. their philosophical thought through what appears to be a very different type of material, right? It doesn't appear to be a treatise or an essay or the other, you know, the mm -hmm. other. so we're finding a lot of philosophy by women in letter writing and in these, in these other modes. So I'm very interested to introduce some of that because that's never been done here before. Um, and then the second thing I'm really uh, interested in, in showing students is as a medievalist, when I look at the early modern period, I can see where it's all coming from. Like I can see those lines of influence and why those, why those yeah. questions were being asked. And so um, our discipline, the members of our discipline in philosophy here are not very his historically oriented. So they tend to teach a subject like early modern philosophy from the perspective of contemporary philosophy. Whereas I'm really interested in sort of thinking about it as a kind of, you know, how did we, how did we come to ask these questions that really shaped the modern world, it shaped the modern scientific community. It shaped all of our basic political theories and structures. You know, from it didn't just spring out of nowhere. So what's what's its own story? So that's what I'm really looking forward to. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that those two things in a way resonate with where we started this conversation, which was, remember you talking about the, you know, your attraction to the, the school of historical and philosophical studies as being at the heart of physically and otherwise at the heart of the, uh, of the Faculty of Arts. And it's true that that, you know, that taking that long view is one of the things that the humanities and social sciences absolutely excel in, that the, the problems that we face today can be better approached, better understood by taking that, that long view, as you say. And also the, the, the second thing which takes us back to the, the start is also just thinking about the, the, the status of women in this discipline and women as, as philosophers. Um, so, no, that, that's been that's fascinating. We've taken it's been a, a really interesting journey in this in this conversation to hear about your own journey, and to hear about those the yes the consolations of philosophy. This this conversation has been a, a consolation as well. I've I've enjoyed it. I've it's been great to learn more about you and and to find to think about some ways of of thinking through this situation as well. So so thank you for what you've shared today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for taking the time. I know how busy you are, Russell. It really means a lot to me. No, it's a great pleasure. Thank you. Take care.